very, very long history, but uh, I've been with the firm for about 19 years. Um, we have offices here. We have offices in Israel, and then we have offices in India, Bangalore, and, and Mumbai. Uh, we're a large fund, you know, about $2.5 billion under management, uh, about 16 partners, for 15 to 16 partners, focused on early stage and a little bit of late stage investments as well, both here as well as, as I said, in Israel and in uh, India and a little bit in China. Yeah, Nareen Gupta, uh, Nexus India Capital. We are focused exclusively on India, early stage, generally speaking. Um, you know, really help entrepreneurs build great companies starting from, from ground zero. Um, at the, we have three partners, three senior partners, and you know, a few other people. All of our partners come with entrepreneurial background. We all started companies. We made them successful. So I think we understand the pain a little bit uh, of what it takes to create companies. Before that, I started a company, and I was running it for 15 years, took it public, and was CEO of a public company, and before that, uh, privately held company. And before that, I went to Stanford, not, not the business school. I went to the engineering school, and I have a PhD from, from Stanford in engineering. So I know the campus a little bit. But they allow you to come back to GSB, I guess. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. They don't make too much fun of me here. <laughs> so, not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> I'm Dias Nesmani. I'm the founder and CEO of Jibox. Uh, we are an online video advertising startup based in India as well as here in the U.S. About half our business is in India, half uh, here in the U.S. My background is, uh, this is my third company. First one was Informatica, which went public in 99. Second was Celequest, which got acquired in 2007. So uh, we'll see uh, about third this one. So far, so far, so good. <laughs> I'm Basa Pradhan. I'm the CEO of Gridstone Research. Uh, Gridstone builds technology for uh, equity research. Uh, we have an office here in San Mateo and um, an office in Mumbai where most of our um, engineering and operations uh, work gets done. Um, I've been uh, with this company for three and a half years. I founded the company with um, uh, some of my co-founders. We um, were all at Infosys Technologies prior to this. I ran uh, global head and uh, I was sorry head of global sales and marketing for uh, three years and a total of eleven years at uh, Infosys. So let me get started with Basab. You, uh, you're the numbers guy, right, and research guy. What do you see happening in India right now in terms of impact on you know the global economic crisis? How's that impacted India? How strong is India in comparison to the U.S.? And maybe if you know if you like, you know, chime in with China, you know, comparisons to China. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so out here, um, I guess you don't need a, any uh, further information on what's going on here. If you read the papers, it's, uh, it's all about, you know, job losses and the, the, the market hitting a 12-year low and so on. Um, in India, if you, if you look at the markets, it, they, they went down um, sh more sharply compared to, to, the, to the index here. Uh, but actually, it's, it's currently 20% up from its lows. Um, if you, I, I was actually in India a week back, and um, uh, I was at my 20-year reunion at uh, the business school I went to, which is I'm Ahmedabad. Um, and, you know, there was a cross-section of views. Obviously, all of us were talking about you know, what's going on in India and, and the world and the financial crisis. And the what you could... Uh, uh, get from the people in the markets, in the capital markets, was that this is bad, it's going to get worse, and it's going to be really long. And India is not going to ex escape the, the brunt of this. Uh, it is, um, uh, you haven't seen nothing yet, right? And the business guys, uh, and there's several people who uh, either run businesses or, or are very senior people in large businesses and have a view across uh, what's happening in, in India, um, they were a little um, less uh, pessimistic. I wouldn't call them optimistic, but a little less pessimistic uh, because and they felt that there were a few things that were going wrong. One was that demand in global markets was drying up because a lot of the demand that comes, in, um, comes from the developed markets and those are the markets that are doing poorly. Uh, so industries like IT services, other export-oriented industries are going to do poorly uh, in India. Uh, 
anything that depends on credit, uh, like the real estate market, like you know, large infrastructure projects, uh, and even you know, manufacturing by and large, and a lot of credit is, is, goes into manufacturing, uh, they're not going to do well because credit is very tight. Um, and, um, and anything to do with the capital markets, of course, uh, in India as well. So, uh, so these are the three things that were, uh, were, uh, were negative and were going to stay negative or get worse uh, in the future. But on the positive side, unlike, say, China, uh, India's um, services and manufacturing exports as a percentage of GDP is, is much smaller than China's. And so that the dependence on the global demand is less, but it is not, you know, it's not um, uh, insignificant, of course. And there's a large domestic market and large middle class, which, uh, which uh, continues to aspire for, you know, better things in life. And uh, they will buy new services, new products. Um, uh, and, of course, if they don't have cash flow, if they don't have jobs, that does impact them. So I think, you know, on balance, uh, my view is that uh, a recovery in India can be expected sooner uh, than here. Um, growth will be muted, but it will uh, it'll still be there for, um, um, uh, for the period of time that there's a recession in the U.S. Okay. So... I guess I'll turn to Narain and promote the investor's perspective. Uh, you guys invest in India, and, and I suppose you have to also, again, end up traveling to India, and when you're in India, also within India to different jurisdictions. Can you, for the audience, especially folks here, a lot of the you know, uh, folks here seem like you know, they've been to India, at least, and are familiar with, but for, especially for people who not understand India as well, or for those you know, uh, few here who may not have ever been to India, can you map India for us? You know, what, what are the jurisdictions that are critical? What are the hot centers of innovation, entrepreneurship in India? And also maybe you know, chime in with your experiences about when you travel to India, how is it different from traveling here? You know, the infrastructure, roads, hotels, uh, the buzz at the airports, you know, and, and the, you, know, you have to you – know, anything that you can talk about for someone who's, tra- who's never been to India or you know, who's traveled but not been an investor or spent a whole lot of time on the ground in India. We'd love to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, I go there every two months. In fact, I'm headed there not next week but the following week. Um, uh, you know, I, I think the, the infrastructure obviously is pretty weak compared, let's say, to, you know, what you see in Europe, what you see in here. It's being upgraded. So, you know, if you, if you go, for example, to uh, Bangalore Airport now, the new Bangalore Airport, it's just as good as any of the other airports that you'll find here. Hmm. Uh, but you go outside, right, and all of a sudden you're hit by lack of access and it takes forever to get anywhere uh, because, you know, the, the access to the airport and the infrastructure and the roads are still narrow and small and so on. Um, but, you know, if you look at the hotels and all, I mean, leaving access aside, uh, you know, you, you see islands of, uh, you know, hotels and restaurants and so on uh, you know, that are just as good as, as anything you would find here. In fact, uh, you know, I would say that the service level in some of those hotels uh, is far, far superior to service levels you'd find in five-star hotels here in the U.S. A lot of that's got to do with, you know, labor being cheaper and so right. uh, services is, 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 is offered very nicely. Uh, I think, uh, you know, airlines, uh, you know, again, you know, very good airlines, uh, uh, now, some of them are in turmoil right now, as, era, as are airlines here, mm-hmm. so there's some restructuring going on in the airlines industry. Flights are getting cut back and so right. on. Uh, but, uh, you know, premier airlines, business airlines, uh, you know, do very well and, uh, and, and perform very well. Again, the congestion is, you know, once you get to the airport, what do you right. do to get from the airport to where you need to go? Uh, so that's always a challenge. But, you know, the, the hubs, you know, I mean, the technology hubs, you know, obviously Bangalore, and then you've got, isol- you know, other, other hubs, you know, Mumbai is the business center, uh, and, and, you know, a lot of deals get done there. Uh, Delhi, Gurgaon especially, sort of an upcoming hub. Uh, then you've got Chennai also as an interesting hub. Hyderabad and Pune, uh, you know, very interesting technology centers. You see a lot of companies from here that have outsourced there. So that's, by and large, the large cities where you want to be. Okay. Narain, do you enjoy traveling to <coughs> India and do you look forward to it? Is that a challenge? Or well, like you can talk about, you know, as lack of running water in the bathrooms at airports to 
the actual, you know, and I tell this to a lot of people, you know, the buzz at the airport, you know, if you want to see what's happening in India, even though you're standing in a big line, it's so exciting, you know, people are on the black page, they're doing deals, you know, while they're, so, you know, any, anything from the extremes uh, that you well, have a I sense think, of. Well, I think traveling to India is a bit harder than flying to New York or flying to Los Angeles, and, uh, you know, First of all, there is no non-stop from here, which always sort of bugs me a little bit, but you know, that's the way it is. I guess I wish I was in New York so I could take a non-stop to, to India. But I, I don't think that really is an issue from my point of view. You know, I think, like Pramod said, you know, we end up traveling to India quite frequently. It is just the way it is. I think outside, once you are in India, it's a bigger problem. I mean, it can take longer to go from you know, the airport in Bombay to our office, which is maybe eight miles away, right. than to fly from Bombay to Delhi, right. which is a thousand miles or eight hundred miles, you know. So I think, I think you can't have that kind of a stuff bother you at all. Right. I mean, I don't, it doesn't bother me even in the least. But you should be prepared for it. You should be prepared for and, it. And not complain and be patient. That's and right. That no, is, I mean, yeah. patient. And your service levels once you reach the hotels are absolutely as promotes mm -hmm. are fantastic. Mm -hmm. I don't think that really, really, you know, really bothers, bothers me. I think the thing that, that is problematic is the, is, the, is the pain our companies suffer because of the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Real estate is very expensive to start to rent offices, good offices, very expensive. They're commuting on those roads every day, wasting two hours of their time. And that's what really bugs me a lot, is right. that there are a lot of productivity being wasted because they are doing it every day. We do it once in a while, it's not the end of the world. But, uh, so I, I would say definitely productivity in India can be lowered because of the infrastructure issues. I think a lot of it is the, how the culture, local culture, deals with it also. I'll sort of give you kind of a number, very interesting. You know, I try to do an analysis of what goes on in India in different places. And I was in Bombay for about six weeks, a year and a half back. And, and you know, I started to say, how many meetings start on time? It's like 85% or 90% meetings in Bombay start on time. In Delhi, the number is 20%. Possibly. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of, you know, very... The India is very uniform in many ways, but also very different in many, many respects. So, you know, I think you're going to... You just got to deal with, with that stuff. But to me, the biggest issue is the productivity. How does it impact the productivity of a common person in India because of poor infrastructure? And I don't think that really affects innovation or anything like that. People, people work around it. I wouldn't worry about that stuff. It's yeah, bad, but I wouldn't worry it's about part it. Of being an entrepreneur, <laughs> part, of, part of being an entrepreneur. Part of being an entrepreneur. I guess let me use that to lead into another discussion, which is more substantive about lack of ecosystem for entrepreneurship as such. You know, we... Typically, you know, folks from Stanford, especially people, some of people here would, you know, two, two guys in a dog in a garage, yeah. you know, would go out, set something up, bootstrap for a little bit, go to their friends, family, raise a bit of angel rounds, uh, get mentors, service providers, lawyers, you know, doing free, you know, work for free or deferrals, uh, other advisors, the whole info ecosystem as we understand it. How much of that is really available or set up in India? And is Bangalore truly, you know, the Silicon Valley in that respect? I would argue that Bangalore is not Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. and the whole India is Silicon Valley, because there's endless innovation in Delhi or Bombay, and different sort of areas have kind of concentrated around various things. Bombay is sort of the center of innovation in the consumer product space and media and financial services and so on. Bangalore clearly, you know, pure technology. So I, I would say that that is India is a is a sort of a, there is innovation all across. Mm -hmm. I I don't think it really matters greatly where you are. It matters some, but not greatly. I think the, the, in a way I like you know, what Pumo said. Is Pune is a good place, Chennai is a good place, Hyderabad is a good place in many, for any kind of company because the housing costs are low. Mm -hmm. And it's just too expensive to live in Bombay for anybody and live near the, the, the work. You know? So it, I think that's the kind of things that, that, that really I would sort of think of in terms of what might create the next sort of a center. But it's much more likely to be, any other small country as probably most of you know. You can fly across India in two and a half hours or something like that, and up and down maybe three hours. You know, so it's not really that that big a deal. So you know, so I I, I would sort of really say that, you know. Yeah. Dias, what would you say? You know, if you're an entrepreneur starting up, compare that you know entrepreneur starting up in the valley to someone starting in, especially for you know technology startup sort of you know business. Yeah. Uh, How is it different and yeah, what's available in India? It was interesting when we. Uh, went to India to look at uh, where to start. You know, I talked to a lot of people and I got as many opinions as, you know, the number of people I met. And I think they were all right in different ways. It depends. If you're looking for the lowest cost labor, you know, some people say go to Coimbatore. Don't go to, you know, Chennai, Bangalore, uh, Bombay, and so on. 
uh, if you're looking, if you're outsourcing, meaning you're, you're sort of a, setting up a call center or some sort of lower skill level operation, those cities are great. Uh, so I, it took me some time to truly understand what they were saying, and you know we ended up picking Bangalore as as a you know because our goal is to uh, develop hardcore technology, and we felt like the best talent for that was in Bangalore. We also wanted to have some basic infrastructure that could help the company get up and running. So we picked it. You know I don't know if it was the best choice in the long run. In fact, we're thinking as we grow, we may set up a satellite and. Pune or something like that for as, as we add more and more people. So I think, um, you know, the major hubs are generally very good. I think the differences are uh, getting to be minimal now in terms of infrastructure. Um, expenses, for example, we found, uh, at least this was, um, say, a year and a half ago, I looked at the office prices between these cities, and there were marginal differences. Really? Uh, and... Uh, hiring people was very difficult in Bangalore, mm -hmm. easier in other cities, and so on and so forth. So you kind of look at the whole picture. It, it also depends on the kind of, kind of business you're starting, trying to start and uh, pick on that basis. It's very hard to say, oh, Pune is the place or Chennai is the place. Right, I guess besides the geographical locations, I want to nail down you know, how easy is it to get the support services that you have or you take for granted here, you know, the access to advisors, mentors. Yeah, I mean, I can speak uh, for Bangalore. Bangalore was, was not very difficult, mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, it's traditionally had some of that network of, uh, with its law firm, accounting, you know, uh, venture capital, investors, et cetera, et cetera. So we didn't have a very difficult time setting up, but, you know, I don't know, if you guys might know a little bit more about some of yeah, those. Yeah, generally available. Okay. Those four or five cities that we talked about, okay. you know, this, you know, Infrastructure is available, services are available, you know, service providers, attorneys. So you could be from an IIT or IIM and do a plug and play sort of, you know, work and get, get started. Pretty quickly. You know, one thing I was going to say about that, you know, if you look at statistics in the U.S., most company people, entrepreneurs, start businesses within 10 miles of their house. That's just, just the numbers. You know, I mean, you don't want to uproot your family and stuff like that. And just, it doesn't really matter that much. It matters some. Particularly now it matters more because Silicon Valley has become the center of it. But make yourself convenient, make it convenient for yourself. Don't uproot your families, don't you know, cause yourself too much pain. You know, you have plenty of pain starting the company and running the company anyway. You start up anyway. So I, my advice is I wouldn't worry about that. Just just do it, make it convenient for yourself. Okay. You know. Okay, I guess back to the investors then. And I've heard, you know, different versions from entrepreneurs and investors, but in terms of availability of early stage investments, uh, Investors, I think, say that there aren't as many early stage opportunities. Entrepreneurs say there aren't as many capital. It's not as accessible in India for early stage sort of. Is this a chicken and egg? I mean, how do you get started in the early stage? You know, what should come first? Should investors set up money and have they for investments and have some commitment that will drive innovation and get more people to start early stage companies and start at the scratch? Or is it that you need to show some success you know, with companies that, you know, the Googles, and then to be able to get that well, whole ecosystem? I, I would say that both sides have a certain amount of fault. I think a lot of the people in India come to us with a, with a quote-unquote business plan. I would say they're not, they don't really understand what it takes to get a company funded, as a steep company funded. I mean, we are looking for companies that are going to scale to large sizes. We're not looking for somebody, you know, running a small business that produces cash flow. That's not really the kind of thing we're doing. I think what, why that is affected is that there are not enough, what I would call, smart angels in India. Mm -hmm. People, you know, I mean, I know when I started a company in the U.S., I called four people and said, hey, this is what I'm planning to do. What do you think? And within an hour or two, you know, you get decent advice. Maybe not perfect. I mean, definitely not perfect. But you get some advice on, hey, you know, you should do this or not that or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that is really, to me, the key is people, entrepreneurs can go to before they come to us. Because, I mean, we are, we are tough. You know, we are going to be tough. We are going to ask and, them and tough that's questions. not different from what they should do here. Right? Absolutely. They, they should, should have do it, all yeah, do it right. here. But most of the people in Silicon Valley, if they don't know five people who can give them advice, right. they're not good entrepreneurs anyway. I would say, you, know, you can call your friends <laughs> and friends' friend and somebody, you know. Everybody I know knows somebody who sort of, you know, can put them in contact with somebody. So, you know, so I think that's kind of the way I would look at it. I think smart, thoughtful angels people can go to, open their kimono, discuss their idea, ask for honest feedback, I think it would be very valuable in India, and that doesn't exist. People come to us sometimes and we say, you know, look, we can give you advice. We can't fund you right now. You know, you really need to polish up your thinking. So I, I would say it's a chicken and egg. You know, maybe more angels will come around once there are more successes and so on. So I, 
I would sort of put it that way. Mm -hmm. I would say both sides. I, I think both sides are to blame from what is happening. From all your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's a little bit of both. Uh, you know, I mean, I'll give you an example of, you know, uh, from an investor perspective, you know, give you a, a real case study in two minutes. You know, we, we got interested some years ago, two years ago, three years ago, in the travel industry, online travel industry in India. Really weren't a lot of players at that time. There was only one company, Make My Trip. And we had looked at, uh, you know, we had been investors here in the U.S. Uh, in GetThere.com, which eventually got bought, very successful IPO and then an acquisition. We looked at that whole industry and said, well, China had done very well. There had been a couple of players in China that had emerged as winners. And so we stipulated a couple of years, three years ago, that the online travel industry in India uh, should be a real growth opportunity. Right. So then we, uh, one of our partners started spending a lot of time looking at that industry. We came across uh, two other companies. I won't name any names because I don't want to embarrass anyone or any of the investors. Uh, the, by the way, are not here. Uh, we, uh, we saw a company, uh, young, uh, young graduate out of uh, Harvard MBA program. Not Stanford. I think that was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that. I was going to say Harvard. Right? We looked, looked at the deal, not the right and deal. we said, no domain experience, mm -hmm. you know, other than, you know, a spreadsheet sheet exercise and perhaps some analysis of the industry. You have no idea how the industry functions. So another deal, same thing. Uh, so we decided well, we're not going to invest in either of those. Uh, so then we said we're going to have to roll our own. So uh, we started to look around and actually found two entrepreneurs in London that were originally from India and were working with an online travel company in the UK. Now, granted, they didn't quite understand the market dynamics of India, but they understand, they understood totally about the systems you got to build and how do you scale systems and so on and so forth. So we convinced these guys to move to India. They were looking to move to India, so, you know, our paths crossed. Um, and we ended up uh, funding the company. Hmm. And, you know, in less than two years of operation, we're the number two company, uh, a company called Yatra.com. Uh, it came from nowhere, hmm. right? Uh, see, that's where, you know, domain experience, background, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, fair amount of experience in the industry really helped out. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an issue of finding, uh, so, you know, you're going back, you know, the, the, you, we see a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, and that, by the way, happens here too, right? So it's no different. You see a lot of entrepreneurs, they don't have the relevant background, they don't have the relevant experience. And it's very difficult to... Uh, to say, well, yes, we'll write a check to you, uh, uh, you know, unless you can show us a team uh, and the founders that have relevant background. That's always, uh, you know, it's one of the mantras. Uh, you know, you have to have entrepreneurs that that have relevant experience. Now, there's always, you know, exceptions. Google, right? Gosh, mm -hmm. you know, but you know, for every Google, there's thousands of companies that fail because the expertise wasn't there to start with. So, so you know, that's very important. So I, I'd like to go back to the Yatra example, and yeah. that would lead into, you know, what, but I think I, I, I'd be jumping ahead of myself, but, and I also want to make sure that we give people here the opportunity of contradicting or calling you out on what you just said about, sure. you know, the, how it works here. Is anyone here, you know, has anyone here had the experience of going in front of us looking to start a business in India where they thought it was a good idea, everything else worked? It would have got funded in the U.S., but for the way things are in India, I guess it didn't get funded. And that's really my question, and 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 Dias, maybe you can help me from the entrepreneur's perspective if you think that's because I mean I guess times are different now, but a few years ago, you know, there were companies being funded on business plans, and but not necessarily experienced entrepreneurs in the valley. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've seen any of those in India, and that's really the heart of entrepreneurship: taking the risk from the investor side, mm -hmm. even if it's you know a small check of you know it's getting started, you know, five hundred thousand to a million dollars. Do you see that happening? There's a lot of uh, very sharp, uh, highly educated, highly skilled engineers uh, uh, that, you know, really can build systems and so on and so forth. See, when we look at companies that, that we see in India, uh, uh, the question you ask is, okay, help me understand where the market is, right? Uh, 
and 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 then the question that comes up is okay so if you were building the next generation XYZ right uh, you ask yourself what, what, where are the early adopters of this XYZ product going to be and if the early adopters and here's the challenge right now mm -hmm. right the challenge is that the early adopters by and large not always but for some of these products end up being companies that are going to be here in the US and Europe and predominantly US mm -hmm. right now the problem that that entrepreneur has, right, is the following, and that is he's sitting 22 hours away by plane ride, right, and his early adopters are going to be here in the U.S. He has no customer intimacy, right, and he can't sort of, you know, walk across the street uh, every other day or, you know, take a ride and say, you know, let me tell you, I'm thinking about this feature, what do you think about this, let me understand what you do today, what are your pain points? Maybe I can come up with something that reduces those pain points. So depends on what product and what market you're serving, right? Now, I think that picture will change, right? Because today, uh, you know, the Indian enterprise market itself, right? If you look at, let's talk about enterprise, right? Financial services companies and industries and so on. Enterprise, uh, you know, you ask yourself, well, why haven't there been a lot of successful Indian software companies that are selling products and licenses? There are companies. This iFlex was reasonably successful. Oracle bought it. But the challenge that we run into is a lot of those entrepreneurs are too far away from where the markets are. Uh, and India yet is not an early adopter of technology. Now that will change, right? And it is changing. And what will happen in India, and is happening in India, uh, is something that happened in the U.S. about 20, 30 years ago. 20, 30 years ago, as wages began to increase, right, what corporations had to do was to invest heavily in technology so that they could still have productivity gains, right? Wages are going up. i got to get productivity gains, otherwise my margins are going to erode, right? Now, India's had the same problem, right? I mean, you hear about wages escalating and, you know, they've slowed down a little bit. But, you know, they'll, they'll pick up again because they, too, have a finite supply of, of engineers, you know, quality engineers and so on. So I think as India, over a period of time, as Indian enterprises start to become early adopters of technology, and they are becoming early adopters of technology slowly, I think there comes a time. I don't know whether it's five years from now or ten years from now, but I can guarantee you that there comes a time when an engineer sitting in Bangalore will not have to fly to the United States, right? We'll take a trip over to Mumbai, right, or Bangalore, and say, you've got the latest and greatest something, and what are your pain points with this latest and greatest something? And I think I can come up with something that will give you better whatever performance, price advantage. So I think we'll get there. Now, in certain areas, it's happening already, right? If you forget the enterprise for a second, if you look at certain sectors of the wireless industry, right, uh, there are certain things that are happening in India that are ahead of here, right? Because, uh, for example, uh, you know, talk about a low-cost phone, right? Uh, low-cost cell phone. You can never design that cell phone here in the U.S., right? Because the engineers here, even though they are very sophisticated, uh, they're too far away from where a five-dollar or a fifteen-dollar cell phone has to work, right? Or has to be made has, at the retail level. It's got to sell for fifteen bucks. So you'll get the iPhones being made here for, you know, the market that's early adopters of high smartphones, but when it comes to a different cell phone that's got to sell for 15 bucks, right, which means the cost of goods got to be like three or four bucks, that'll never get designed here. That has to be designed there. So if someone came to us here in the Valley and said, I want to design a $15 phone for you, it says, you know, uh, you ought to be sitting in Bangalore. We'll move you there. We'll actually pair you with someone. And, and, and by the same token, you know, we come across engineers in, the, in, the, in, in Bangalore, they'll say, I got this great idea of the next generation SOA architecture, services only, or whatever, right? What we do then in that case is say, you know, since your markets are going to be in the U.S., let me tell you what, we ought to set up a cross-border company. And the cross-border company to us, and these gentlemen to some extent reflect that as well, is it has to be a company that's got presence here and presence there as well. You can do all the development work there, but the product management people that are going to be interfacing with customers and interfacing with the early adopters, they ought to be sitting here, and let's collaborate together. 
So, you know, there's different models of starting these companies and funding these companies. Disasters have been where you leave a bunch of engineers all by themselves, right? <laughs> and they design something. They always design something, but the question is, is that what the market needs, right? Uh, in fact, you know, I, I, was, I mean, I, I kid you not, I, I remember, and, and, and engineers are very sharp, don't get me wrong, I remember interviewing a VP of engineering for one of my companies about two years ago, and he wanted to actually meet with me. I was on one of the board of directors of the company. And you know what questions he had for me? He wanted to know, okay, what are your views on product management? Are you going to hire a VP of product management into this company? And I said, absolutely. We don't have one yet, but we will. We're, we're looking at hiring one. So then I asked him, I said, why are you concerned about that? And, you know, this is, this is what this guy told me, and I thought it was fascinating. He says, Pramod, as a VP of engineering, I can build anything. Give me enough time and enough money, I'll build anything. But the big question is, Am I building the right thing, right? <laughs> does anyone care at the end of the exercise whether I built it or not, right? And does it work or not? Is someone going to buy it? Is someone going to pay for it, right? So I think that product management issue, and right now uh, there are product management issues in India, right? You don't have enough people there yet, enough engineers, that have product management expertise. Uh, now, they're moving back slowly, and I think you're seeing companies here that are sort of what I call cross-border companies, where, you know, their markets might be here, India as well, but here as well. And so, you know, they've got presence here as, as well as back in India. So is it that you say, are you saying that we're not really likely to see a Facebook developing in India? All, uh, because the usership for something like that is more in the U.S. and then it spreads outside, but you need to... It depends on the industry. Right. Yeah. It depends on the industry. And the challenge in India, right? I mean, the, yeah. the number of computers and access and all of that to at least yeah. get that started. And, I think uh, there's another issue here also, I mean, and this is sort of more, just like there are entrepreneurs in India who are engineers and haven't got the access knowledge of the, their market. Uh, I think the same is true also of investors, and this is not a generalization, but a lot of investors who enter India... Uh, you can look on your left. Uh, yeah, and, and, you know, the first question is, boy, you know, this is a strange, odd market. Things happen very differently here. The safe thing to do is find a company that has already got customers, got revenue, got some traction. Better to invest there than to find a guy who walks in my door who's an engineer from IIT and says, I've got a brilliant idea. Because, you know, truth be told, more than just a brilliant idea and some, you know, engineering expertise, it takes a lot more to build a company, whether in the U.S. or in India, so I think there's some of that. You know, I, you know, I've spoken to a lot of investors who are sort of just about getting in the Indian market, and I can tell their safety is, boy, you know, if you've been in Silicon Valley, you've built a company there, and you are now coming to India, yes, I want to talk to you. But if you're just right. walking in from an IIT, come to me later, you know, after you've got your first customers and so on. So I think and, – and Unless it, you're selling a $15 phone, I guess. Uh, but but even then, the yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's for a local market, it's right. a little but if easier. Your Facebook come to but but I, but I think even in that case, right? If you if you as an investor haven't spent enough time in India, you wonder about, boy, how is this going to be marketed? Sure. Who do you need yep. to work with? Who are your partners going to have to be? Do you need to work with the government? What you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a little bit of that fear. It's changing because the knowledge is just like product knowledge. I, I was amazed at some of the companies in terms of thanks to the web, how much knowledge they have about U.S. markets, because you can find it on the web. Mm -hmm. You know, likewise, for investors. So I think it's changing, but I think there's a little bit of a problem on both sides right now, which yeah. hopefully is getting over. And I want to ask the question about, will there be a Facebook coming out of India? Mm -hmm. So I think you have to look at, look at, it's going to be a company like Skype. Mm -hmm. You know, the, Skype started in Estonia, wherever, you know, people were all over the place. And I think the, the model was very different. India, the U.S. is not as cost conscious as India is, or Estonia might have been, it made more sense to start a company like Skype because I mean, nobody could pay for phone calls, international calls, and so on. You're solving so a problem. You're solving a problem that is typical for that, that situation, but that can be taken worldwide. Mm -hmm. you know, so I think that it's a, that's the kind of, let's say mobile, mobile money, money mm -hmm. transfer or, or you know, payments. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to start a company in the U.S. to do right. that. I mean, it's too easy to have credit. Everybody has credit cards and so on, but in India, nobody has credit cards. So maybe it makes sense to start a company there. It can get a big market share because people don't have credit cards. So, I mean, that's just one example. But the challenge would be to grow that and expand that to the U.S. But because it, but then there but isn't that much of a market. Uh, yeah, you don't have a global company coming out of Exactly. There. So, you know, you could ultimately, it would be convenient to, to be able to wave your phone mm -hmm. and make your groceries, you know, payment. Or, you know, your Starbucks coffee payment. Right. With waving your, rather than taking the cash out of your pocket or using a credit card. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to happen here. Right. Because it's too easy. Too many, there are too many credit cards here. Right. So I think you have to think very differently in India 
And I do believe that, well, Facebook is a bad example since, you know, everybody's sort of shooting at them these days. But let's say, <laughs> Twitter. you know, Twitter, I guess. whatever, yeah. you know, eBay or whatever, or Facebook, anyway. So I think a company like that will come out of India, but it won't look anything like Facebook. Mm -hmm. It'll be very different. Right. It'll be a very different company. So and and Promos is funding some of those companies. You know, we are funding some of those companies as well. It's going to be different. The, the big thing in India is what I say is business model innovation. How do you yeah. do something at a lower cost? and provide better, uh, higher quality service. So I guess to summarize product. that discussion, I guess, I mean, if you look into sets of things. Not, not every company that gets started in India is going to have a product or service that's relevant here. Right. Right? Absolutely. And neither should we. You know, you, right. don't, you don't sit there and say, well, you know, well, you got it, it's working in India, now we got to go to the U.S. Why? I mean, the Indian market is large enough. We have a company, uh, you know, you talk about Facebook, it's not a Facebook, but it's somewhat, you know, in an adjacent space. It's a company called Suleika, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Suleika is a sort of an online portal. You go there. It's, it's very good for yellow pages and classifieds. Mm -hmm. Now, India's got a real problem. You know, you don't have really efficient yellow pages. Small businesses, you know, uh, don't have yellow pages and so on, as you and I know them here in the U.S. And so they, they serve a local need, right? Which, and so that model would never work here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. There is no need for that kind of a model. But it's got tremendous need in India. And so, you know, they're focused on that market. And, and, and so it's like that $15 cell phone, right? No need for it here, but gosh, absolute tremendous need for, so you know, so it's a localized business model that probably applies only to that part of the world, maybe China and so on, but right. just focus. So I guess to summarize that discussion, I mean, if you're someone starting to, looking to start a business in India, be careful of what the market is, you know, focus on the market right. and yeah. don't try what's to. Your, what, what's your service, a product, right. and what's your market, right? right? And do you have relevant expertise both on the product side, management, product management and marketing side, as well as the engineering side, to be able to go address that market? And to be sure, I want to give credit to investors also, you know, the guy, folks like yourselves who are doing good stuff in India. I mean, uh, Comley is a good example. Yatra is another good example. These are companies that probably would not have got funded in the U.S. because, you know, there is, a dearth, you know, there is no dearth of, you know, the ad networks or online business travels. But yeah, if you right. can structure it for yeah. something, you know, cut and paste what works yeah. here. And, and, and it would have been experience. stupid to start a travel company for India based here. Right. right. I mean, like, right. you know, come on, give me a But break. if you structure it well, then that you're more right. likely to act. And if you have good quality products yeah. or technology and team, yeah. then and obviously it goes hand in hand with understanding the market. But then you're likely to get, you know, make it really successful for the Indian market, which itself is growing. Right. So that could be a good sound business model. You know, it operates differently in India, mm -hmm. and Pramod can tell you all the differences compared to the U.S. You can't just copy right. Expedia and move it to India. It's going to be a failure. Yeah, absolutely. And I, think, and I think that is the key is that, you, know, you I mean, for us, we're investing in India since that's all we do. The model, you know, you learn from the U.S., and you learn more of what you should not do from the U.S. rather than learn what you do from the U.S. You know, that's what the sort of experience tells you is what you should not be doing. And I think you have to have a model that's suited for India. And I think, you know, if you have an investor, Pramod has a, has a good team in India, we have a very good team in India as well. I think unless you have somebody who lives there and breathes the air and knows what's going on, you know, if you are thinking that you'll fly in there one, one day and make an investment, right. it's going to be a disaster. I guess the good I think, analogy I think you've got to really be, fully understand what's going on, yeah. both the positives and negatives. India has a lot of risks in all kinds of things right. that you don't even think about here. Yeah, and we'll, we should talk about that. I mean, but I just want to summarize that. A good, good analogy might be McDonald's, right? I mean, Obviously, McDonald's all over, but, you know, when they were looking to get into India, they better be prepared to have an aloo burger on the menu, right? Yeah. You've got to have that. Otherwise, you know, not necessarily a beef burger, but only an yeah. aloo burger. But it's, again, the, ma the model works, though. The model works. Right. So you would give, give more weightage to a strong, flushed-out team that's, you know, that can execute yeah, in India strong, than, strong, right, than you would here in the that's working together. Because you can build here. You can get people on stock that's options right. and get yeah. them interested. But see, the challenge is, you know, if you, if you do a startup, you're not going to have the team. That's the problem. Right. So, so therefore, you know, it gets back to who are you funding, right? Mm -hmm. And do you have a common vision, right? Uh, does the entrepreneur uh, understand that, gee, over a period of time, he's going to have to add team members? Yeah, frankly, it's no different than, than what's over here, right? I mean, when we start companies here, you don't have a total team, mm -hmm. right? You might have two guys. You might have an engineering person, and you might have some marketing skills right. on the team. But... By, yeah, yeah. And by team, by definition, is not complete. It's two or three guys in a garage, right? And so, but you have to at least, you know, get a sense for is there some common thinking here, right? Commonality in thinking. Uh, is is the entrepreneur coachable, right? It's no different here than there, right? Is this someone that's going to listen, right? Uh, and those are those are reference checks. Those are judgment calls on interaction with a person. 
to see is this a coachable person or is this a stubborn person, mm -hmm. right? Will he ever take advice from his board? Mm -hmm. Let me use that to, I guess, the point earlier about, to lead into another discussion, maybe jumping ahead. But what are the exit opportunities available in India? I mean, especially, you know, public capital markets are probably fairly strong now, robust, especially if you compare them to what's happening in the U.S. But what about M&A? And one of the challenges I hear about is we don't have as many big players that are out there, the Cisco's, the Oracle's, the Ebay's, that you know, are always looking for acquisitions. We have the reliances that are, I don't know what, whether they're looking for acquisitions, they're probably looking to steal the intellectual property. Not necessarily talking about reliance as such, but the big players. So you want to be careful, and the opportunity isn't as high in India for existing companies, a developed I think that's base true. of existing companies. I think that's true. How yeah. do you overcome that challenge? And then, you know, is that something that you, how much weight is that there is in that investment philosophy and how, how do you see that changing? Well, that, you know, so, so, I mean, that goes back to, you know, you have to execute, you have to get bigger, right? Okay. I mean, there are companies that don't execute and, you know, they get acquired, but those are fireside sales, mm -hmm. right? No one makes any money, mm -hmm. right? Um, and yes, you're right. I think by and large, uh, you know, there's less M&As that take place within the country uh, uh, than, than you would see out here in a, in a market that's a little bit more efficient. Right. Dais, how, how would you grow your company in India, uh, given those challenges, and, and especially if, you know, if you're a mobile company, for example, and you are reliant on the big telcos, you know, the reliance is the airtels, they're not going to play, play ball as much. They're not going to be doing strategic partnerships or, you know, uh, channel distributions for you where they don't make, you know, a large portion of right. what, you know, the, the, of the pie. Yeah, I, I think IPOs in India, I mean, the, the market is better, but the criteria is, 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 uh, just as high, possibly higher, meaning you have to get to a you know, tremendous size and scale and profitability and so on and so forth. So that's possible, but you know, uh, I think you can't go into it assuming that's that's the only option. I think the other interesting option, you know, for a company like us and certainly others, could be uh, as India continues to grow and progress as a market, a lot of U.S. and European companies want a presence in India. So let's say whether it's search or it's uh, video or it's uh, you know whatever business it is. If you want to enter the Indian market and you aren't already there because the market's already evolved, what's the next best thing? Acquire a company that's got a good footprint there. So I think the acquisitions aren't necessarily Indian companies buying uh, these startups. I think it's American, European, and other companies that, that want to be in the market. So I think we'll, we'll see a lot of that. You know, right now... Uh, and they'll value your local... Well, exactly, because entering a company in India requires so much local expertise, right. talent, and so on and so forth that if you said... I mean, if you think of Starbucks, right, and tried to enter India, and boy, you know, they, they backed out pretty quickly when they realized, A, very different environment, B, there was already some players in there. There's going to be several of those, and then the next thing is, well, it's a growing market. We need a, uh, a play there. What's the next best thing to do? Buy your way into it. And that's, I think, a good exit for, uh, for us and for any, any other companies uh, there. I want to also get the benefit of, you know, for the academic-minded people here, on legal and you know regulatory framework, uh, if you could please compare the structure, typical structure of an investment into an Indian portfolio company with a typical structure of a Delaware company, what rights? I mean, if for someone who's looking to invest in an Indian company or someone who's looking to set up an Indian company that will need investment from a U.S. investor, what are the typical rights that you would get in India that you would not necessarily get in the U.S. and vice versa? You know, what what are the ones that you would get in the U.S. that you would not? expect because of the existing framework in, in Indian companies? And how, are there any challenges in structuring those investments as such? Well, I mean, there are some challenges in Indian companies, but we try to make our agreements as similar to the U.S. investment as possible. You know, in India, it has different regulations about preferred stock in, in companies and so on, and rather than going into the details of that. But, you know, we work with those regulations and still get to essentially, not quite, but essentially the same same result. Our view is that anything that has been proven in the U.S. has worked for 25 years, doesn't need to be changed in India, right. don't change it. I mean, Tweak it for the Companies Act, whatever. I, you know, fit them into the Companies Act and make them work. Right. I mean, there's plenty of other places to innovate. Mm -hmm. Why bother with that? that <laughs> On paper. Stuff. You know, paper leave works. it for the dumb lawyers to figure <laughs> out, right? Well, you know, I think there are enough other other issues to deal with. So I, I would, I, I think we just try to make it as much as possible. Sometimes when you have, you have big uh, corporate investors in a company, mm -hmm. 
there can be a little bit of a problem with that. There are some kind of laws about 26% ownership. And anyway, not worth going into that. that certain problem. industries. Certain industries. Certain, right. industries. certain industries and so Media, on. Media, telecom and so on, you know, you, you cannot, uh, has to be 26% ownership by, by the local authorities. In some cases, yeah. more like 51. In some cases, more like 51, like insurance yeah. and all that. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, sometimes you have to go, I mean, we had to go for a couple of our investments yeah. to the Ministry of Finance, and it's a nightmare, but they're good people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they, they, they take time, they get it done. I think a more <laughs> relevant thing for people wanting to invest there is the whole issue of double taxation. That's right. So, therefore, you know, uh, a lot of our, all our investments uh, will, go, will go through a Mauritius or a Cayman Island entity because mm -hmm. of tax treaties that exist between Cayman and Mauritius and India. The whole idea is you don't want, you don't want to pay, pay tax twice, right? right? You don't want to sell your investment and then pay taxes in India and then also pay taxes here. So, uh, so there are some tax issues and so on. Right. Uh, and I can quickly state, so under the India Mauritius tax treaty, the, the authorities look at you know the jurisdiction of the investor, and if you set up a Mauritius entity, then it's a Mauritius entity that pays taxes according to the laws of Mauritius, and capital gains in Mauritius, for example, is zero. So you avoid having to pay taxes. Right? Right. So just to summarize yeah. that, yeah. what's the typical size of an investment in India? And and I guess going back to what you were saying, Rind, the emotional speech about you know having the the time and years that founders are putting in. What should they expect? You know, what percentage of the company they should expect post Series A finance? You know, I, I would say India is a market where there is nothing like a typical okay. Series A. I mean, I think. Because a lot of the people in India start companies with their own money or their parents' funding and so on. The cost of getting things going in India at a very early stage can be very low. Mm -hmm. you know. so, so I think I, I would say that our Series A investments vary or a very wide range mm -hmm. from a million dollars to ten million dollars. Okay. And it depends on, on what the company needs, what does it need to do to operate in the next... 12, 18, 24 months, what, what, is, what really makes month. sense and so on. I mean, we really focus on, of course, returns for ourselves, but also having a significant ownership for the entrepreneurs because we, we believe that's good for us, obviously, that entrepreneurs have big ownership. And sometimes raising too much money can be detrimental to the, to the entrepreneurs. So you want to raise the right amount of money. It, there is a bigger variation than there might be in the U.S. But I think the U.S. is also getting... Well, in a way, we are, no, we are, we are like the U.S. used to be in the 80s. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I saw investments of less than a million dollars that time in Series A and as much as $20 million. So I think I, think, I wouldn't call it typical, any number of typical, maybe, you know, I don't know. It's, it's all of them, yeah. Okay. yeah. Because, you know, what you find also is, you know, it's not just the issue of Series A. Because mm -hmm. you find, you know, sometimes it's a startup. So a startup in a Series A is not a large right. amount, right? And then you might find a company that's been around for two or three years, right, and has been bootstrapped and has got revenue and so on. So a Series A invest, uh, investment in that in that company is a different company, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a different value. So that's not different from what you would do. What you see here, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Inside, you know, the dollar you can stretch more. Yeah, in India, right. so the numbers yeah. are somewhat different. Yeah. yeah. But one thing I would say though is, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, I think the Indian entrepreneur. Uh, uh, is very cash conscious mm -hmm. because they have had to, for a very, very long period of time, uh, survive with very little outside capital. So, you know, it's just amazing how effectively they are able to stretch the dollar uh, or, or the rupee, you know, the cap capital, outside capital that they get. Just amazing. Uh, I guess talk, talk about control also, then how likely are they to, you know, to, to be excited about giving up control of a family-run sort of a venture related to, you know, thinking that, you know, they probably need less money because they can stretch it more, thereby giving up less of their company and retaining control. And how important is it for you to have significant amount of, op not necessarily operational, but certainly decision-making control? And how, any interesting instances of where, you know, that's clashed and because of more cultural Well, there's always, you know, there's always clashes everywhere, right? But in specific to India because of the yeah, unique nature of... Not really, you know, it's the same. Because, yeah. you know, a lot of companies that we've funded, right, uh, are not family-owned businesses mm -hmm. necessarily, right? Now, they might have been some family money, but some of these businesses mm -hmm. are no different than what you see here, right? Two or three entrepreneurs get together, you know, there might be friends, there might be business associates from the past... And, and uh, you know, we just funded a company which is a group of people that came out of Infosys. In fact, the Finical guys, right? Is that They're Patty and all those guys. You probably know those guys, yeah. Patty and Runga and so on, right? Mm. Uh, so, you know, these are not family. Now, they had their own money in there, right. absolutely. For two years, three years, they put their own money, right? Uh, 
but yeah. they knew that you know they they had a capital structure where they could see they, they could investors yeah. and what dilution exactly and, and dilution and you know and then even though you know we, we might not have majority control in the business mm-hmm. you know in terms of ownership you know as you've seen agreements and all you can you know get veto rights and a whole country, you know certain matters right okay. uh, that are genuine right where you 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 really need to have a, a common understanding right and a and a and a, and a unified understanding so you can't do acquisition unless everyone agrees you can't take on debt unless everyone agrees you know which is no different than the Government. kinds of governance you would have here in series a deals right? so i guess that leads me to the question but you maybe you answered that already and I'll now there the, now there are some family owned right. businesses are, right okay. and and you know some of the later stage deals that we see are family owned businesses mm-hmm. right and it's a nightmare dealing with those <laughs> uh, uh, Can you name names or no? Can name names. <laughs> no, I, I How think, about uh, I think absolutely. I think the later stage family-owned business. No different than family-owned businesses here. Sure, yeah. Sure. Right. I mean, go talk to T A and Spectrum and so on that do investments in later stage companies here in the U S that have been bootstrapped. Right. And you're the first money going into a company that's fifty, sixty million in revenue, and the founder owns ninety-nine percent. Right. Well, uh, you know, same issues. Right. So you take you you wear the same hat. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. So I guess I mean, as I was saying, you may have answered this question already, but I'd love to get others also. What are things that entrepreneurs in India can learn from their counterparts here, and so I suppose vice versa in terms of innovation and how to set things up? Or are there any things that, or are there any similarities or differences that we can learn from from you know, each I, other? I would say the Indian entrepreneurs. The good thing about the U.S. is people think big, and I think the U.S. Indian entrepreneurs sometimes don't think big enough. you know you got to you got to start from a big thinking and in a reality maybe a little different and you got to sort of moderate your thinking based on that but indian entrepreneurs generally they can, people come to us with a plan will i have 10 million dollars in revenue in 6 years i mean what do we do with that company mm-hmm. it really doesn't make sense for us it's a great family business you can produce cash flow you can live happily ever after that lifestyle business. lifestyle <laughs> business so you know i think i think in india just people don't think think big enough you know that's second thing i would say is that team building is so critical and i don't think the indian entrepreneurs often time understand the importance of team building you know it is just so critical to bring in the best people in the company give them whatever reasonably you have to give them and so on i think in the us we focus on that we you know we think that's really critical so i think there are few things many things you know that you can you can and you know the U, the us entrepreneurs also have a a sense of urgency that is sometimes not there in any but well, that's a cultural thing right <laughs> <laughs> but you know we we just got to change that because it's not going to work you know so i think i think there are a few things but l- let me i just want to add uh, yeah. one thing going the other way which uh, i feel that uh, uh, indian entrepreneurs do uh, really well and 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 you know now you and promote have met many many more than i have but they uh, they exist and thrive in an environment where there is no reliability on uh, that in the infrastructure when i say infrastructure i mean you know you're building a company based on services that you get from other people other agencies and you manage to I mean, just getting a permit from the government it could take one month it could take a year and you have to run a company uh, and avoid the pitfalls of these kinds of things you're going for a meeting it could take one hour it could take half a day uh and and so you you manage to work through these kinds of uh, situations it requires a real tolerance uh for uh, you know otherwise your you know your head will explode <laughs> if you're not used to this stuff yeah, i think i think you can you can you can learn a few things i think i promote yes, talked about sure. capital efficiency mm-hmm. i think the us entrepreneurs by and large don't understand capital efficiency how important and how well they can manage with less money i think i would call it being more adaptive you know i think indian entrepreneurs are a lot more adaptive than the us entrepreneurs you know here you get hit by something you get to fall apart you know indian entrepreneurs they don't care they disasters happen every day yes. as, as long as they don't get hit they don't <laughs> yeah. keep going forward and, and you know you have to right in fact you know you i mean uh, he, he knows that cuz you know you've been involved with persistent a little bit you know we have an investment in a company called mm-hmm. persistent mm-hmm. systems right it's a company that is outsourced product to mm-hmm. they took million dollars outside capital mm-hmm. initially mm-hmm. and they bootstrapped on a million dollars right and we got in the company is already 35 million in revenue mm-hmm. so we put some money in they, they didn't need the money right the only reason they said is well we'll take money because we want your help right mm-hmm. and so we'll we'll take money 
but I mean, no, that's a somewhat of a family-owned business, right? Mm -hmm. uh, father and son, right. mostly okay. son, but right. you know, father influence and so on. Million dollars. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. I mean, very hard to find those kinds of businesses, right? <laughs> you you try to do those businesses mm -hmm. here today. Gosh, you know, before you know it, well, you know, I need 35 million bucks to get to cash flow break even, okay. and then the 35 ends up being 70, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> and I, 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 in some respects, that was a groundbreaking sort of investment yeah, also. Yeah, so I know I was at Cooley, you know, helping you guys set up the Mauritius. So it was the first Mauritius investment for you guys. For, for we were doing, uh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And there was a sense that, you know, this was, and it obviously led to really good things about, you know, that yeah, structure working yeah. and all of that as well. Uh, uh, let me jump on the Slumdog Millionaire type of you know, scenario we're laying, laying down here. You know, it's a bandwagon; everyone knows about it. So, I guess uh, you, you mentioned about you know being able to stretch and being innovative, and you know, respects that are different. And you know, obviously, a lot of people here understand that with the Slumdog Millionaire side of description. Let me lead that, uh, and, and this is my last question. And I'll open it up to you know any other questions. But then you mentioned in our chat earlier. You know, there are the this, this delight uh, or sunlight. I think company that you're talking about. Are there opportunities for investors here or even entrepreneurs to look at those below middle class? Everyone talks about India's middle class, but the, just below middle class kind of you know opportunities of this teeming you know need and for growth, and they have different needs. You know, it's not necessarily the internet, but the basic lighting system. Yeah. Uh, so but can you speak to some yeah, of that? Yeah, I think well. D-Light Design actually it's started by two GSB graduates, mm -hmm. you know, Sam Goldman, and you probably know them better than you know we do. And, you know, they had never lived in India. They got to India, start this company. And I think in every way, they have really innovated. The, the product is an is a inexpensive lighting for rural use. Solar power it can also be charged and so on. And I think the whole thing that, that you know, is there, you can, there's a tremendous market. The, you know, the, the villages and small towns in India are richer than they used to ever, they were ever before. You know, some of the small towns are actually, you know, richer than big cities like Delhi and Bombay. So, I, but I think when you come up with the products like that, they really have to fit the Indian Indian environment. This thing has to be low low cost, obviously. It has to be completely sealed. A lot of dust in small villages. You know, this light is completely sealed. Wouldn't make sense for the U.S. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, is you've got to figure out how to use the existing infrastructure or whatever there is, because this kind of a product, cost of distribution can kill you. And this company has a cost of distribution, which is less than 10% of the price of the product. And what they're doing is basically using existing channels. You know, they have a partnership with Mahindra and Mahindra, which is the biggest tra tractor manufacturer in India. They have shops in every village or every, you know, town and so on. And so basically, it gives the farmers a reason to come to their shop and they hopefully right. end up getting exposed to Minecraft products and so on. So uh, the, I think you can do no infrastructure and trying to reach each individual. Then you can't. Right, right. You can't really do that. You can't scale fast right. enough. And the company obviously is doing very well. And I say, you know, it's not an easiest business, but the opportunities are tremendous. And it's a business that will be, infrastructure will be hard to replicate. Mm -hmm. Once you have signed up with Minecraft, Minecraft, somebody else can't really do the same thing, you know, with them. So, so I think, do I, others have thoughts about, you know, those side of, sort of opportunities below the surface, not the internet, the exciting stuff that we are aware of in India. Opportunities there and, you know, and promote, for example, some, would you fund something like that? And, and I asked, would you start something like that there in India? Yeah, yeah I think there, are, yeah, I, I absolutely agree, there are those uh, opportunities at the grassroots level. If you can figure out uh, distribution, which is the biggest challenge. You know, I heard of uh, uh, ideas or companies doing things like clean water, you know, mm -hmm. in villages. You have a little unit there, 50 paise or whatever, people come and put some money, they get clean water. I mean, uh, it's easy to build these systems. The question is how do you get them right. out That's there? The, how do you collect right. the money? How do you, you know, right. all of that. And and um, a lot of Indian business like Mandra being one, there's banks and others that have set up some basic infrastructure there to the extent you can tap into mm -hmm. that and solve the distribution problem. I, I think there's plenty of option here. And I agree, it's, it's a... It's a land of masses and everything. We talk about, you know, 180 million cell phones. You know, everything just scales right. very, very quickly if it catches on. Mm. You'd rather be selling 100 million phones or $15 no, absolutely. than... Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, 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 the transactions you know, are small. You know, 70, it's 70 percent of the Indian population lives in small yeah. villages, right? right. So it's, I mean, it's, tier three, tier four, tier and five. How cities. easy is it to find the? Partners, the channel partners, I mean, the Ifcos and the Mahindras. But you know, you have to be innovative in everything. You know, in this company, Mahindras actually have a small investment. And, right. you know, we did that. We brought them in just for that reason, mm -hmm. you know, with that, that goal in mind. And, you know, we told them that that's the reason we want you as an investor. 
are you really comfortable, you know, considering that and so on. I think you, you've got to make it profitable for whoever your partner is. It's nothing is easy. But, you know, if your partner is going to make money from it, you know, it's going to, their business is going to do better, sure, people will sign up in a, in a heartbeat. Actually, you know, that itself I've, I've um, heard of. Um, I don't know if the company exists yet, but I've heard of business plans which are um, where you're supposed to, where they want to set up a rural distribution uh, network because, you know, they expect that uh, so tap, a lot of tap these into things, it, right? Anyone yeah, can tap yeah, into yeah, it. Yeah, so, yeah. so I mean, I, so, you know, before I joined Infosys, I, I worked for five years uh, with uh, Hindustan Lever, which is the largest uh, consumer products company. And, and um, the rural um, distribution is, is it almost. I mean, that, that's what, you know, marketing and rural distribution decides your, your success or failure in, in the markets. And pricing, of course, that's another thing which is extremely important. You and know, we used to it and you're done, practically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you'd add, uh, we, I was in the uh, packaged tea uh, division, and uh, whenever we added a product that was smaller and lower priced, uh, then what we had, so we had, you know, 50 grams, um, we introduced 50 grams, 50 grams would be double the volume of 100 grams, then we'd introduce 25 grams, that would be double the volume of 25 grams. So the, and this is all where the price per kilo is higher, and the margin per kilo is higher for the company. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine what the, the unit price is doing there, it's, you know, the company is making more money, and uh, um, so, so it's a, it's a very, very interesting uh, place, the whole rural di distribution. I think it, that's, that's, that itself, distribution infrastructure is, is a good uh, startup idea. And I don't want to sound too much as a, as a, as like a VC, but you, know, you have to know your market and really right. believe in that market. Really. And I can give you an example. I mean, ex-GSB students, you know, I started working with them two years ago, and they, the team came, came together, and they were thinking of doing you know, uh, these uh, movie theaters, you know, a chain of movie mm -hmm. theaters across India. And I thought, you know, Mm -hmm. oh, you know, this is going to be a it's not the best place to be doing it. Mean, we have established players, and what they were doing is, you know, partnering with a Mexican company will make it even more expensive, but, you know, really good yeah. service and all of that. Uh, so it's not for me to, you know, necessarily the investors to say, you know, tell you whether it's a good idea or not. You should have done your homework and come back with a passion. And, and really, you know, as, as entrepreneurs here, if the investors don't do it, you know, it's their problem, not yours. And you still go forward for it, and you create that market. And then these guys, two years down, have actually raised three hundred million dollars, are going gangbusters and developing. Yeah, these I think one thing I would add is, you know, there are a lot of opportunities, but uh, you definitely don't want to be sitting here in Silicon Valley dreaming right. them up. Right. <laughs> you need to get out there because almost every business. I mean, give you an example that you know we all understand. If you look at the uh, Starbucks coffee day example, right? There are nuances. For example. When I first walked into a coffee day, uh, I went and stood at the counter, and everybody's looking at me strangely, what are you doing there? You're supposed to sit down, and they come and serve you. Right. <laughs> well, that's how it works in India. You don't go stand in line at the counter. I, think, I don't think Starbucks got that. I, I, I don't know if this is a fact, but I'm just thinking out loud, if you enter the market thinking we're going to replicate something here. So I think you really have to be there. We ended up you know, innovating our business in India substantially, and even today is different from how we do it here. But it was just trying to figure out what works there, how, what your pricing model needs to be, how you distribute the product. It's very different. I think my base advice is don't don't come up with a business plan here and try to go up with a I think Starbucks not.